we start with our uh, program. Uh, so, good evening. At the outset, so we thank the organizing committees of ICA and Internet for giving us this opportunity and providing this platform. Excuse me, sir. A screen share is not is proper. We are not getting the screen share. You are not in the screen share. Just one sec. Share. Share sound. Okay. Just one sec. I'll go back from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, I'm just showing from the beginning. Good evening. At the outset, I would thank the organizing committees of ICA and Trinet for giving us this opportunity and providing this platform for speaking to you on this topic, physics for an anesthesiologist. Now, the question comes into the mind, why physics? We actually hated physics and that's why we took Medicine. Medicine. <laughs> and green physics? I don't think so. Having said that, our daily activities involve physics. The pressure cooker, the filling of the car with fuel or air, the aeroplane, the boiling of water, the hot oven plate, etc. As anesthesiologist, we have to deal with liquids, gases under pressures, their relations, and a lot of monitoring devices for which the understanding of basic physics is required. In fact, our daily anesthesia activity revolves around physics and its principles. When we are using the high-end boil separators, the operating lights, the fluid warmers, the bear huggers, the equipments and ultrasound for blocks, the monitoring apparatus and the video laryngoscope and so on. The diathermy machine, the defibrillator, the operating microscope, the C arm and the fiber optic scope. Today I will be talking on SI units a little bit on simple mechanics, applications of gas laws, and if time permits, a little bit on resonance and damping. The creation of decimal metric units began during the 18th century, during French Revolution. Eminent scientists grouped together and thought that there has to be a standard system of measurement for which, in 1960, the International System of Units was formed. Unfortunately, still today, they are not followed universally. So, what are the fundamental SI units? The mnemonic to remember them is MAC. There are seven fundamental SI units. The second unit of time, the meter being the unit of length, the moles being the amount of substance, the amperes being the unit of electric current, the candela being unit for luminous intensity, the kelvin being unit of temperature, and kilogram being unit of mass. So these are the fundamental SI units with their symbols. This slide is the definition of the SI units, fundamental SI units. I'm not going to go into details of it. There are two supplementary SI units which have been taken away in the year 1995. They are plane angle called radian and solid angle called steradian. So what are the derived SI units? They are expressed either in multiplication or division of the fundamental units. So the derived units can be easier to be considered as derived electrical units and derived non-electrical units. So the derived SI units of importance of measurements are area, volume, 
density, velocity, acceleration, and the unit is given in the table is clear. There are special SI units with special symbols. For frequency, it is Hertz. For force, it is Newton. For pressure, it is Pascal. For energy or work, it is Joules. For power, it is Watts. For electrical charge, it's Coulomb. For potential difference, it's Volt. For capacitance, Farad. And for resistance, it's Ohm. This table shows actually from 10 to the power of 0 to 10 to the power of 24 and 10 to the power of minus 24. They are all labeled with some words, deca, hecto, kila, etc., etc. Interestingly, 10 to the power of 100 is known as Google, which was the basis for the name of internet search engine Google. Actually, it was a misspelling, but everyone now really refers to Google and it's really a helping hand for us to search immediately anything we want. Coming to simple mechanics, what is force? Force is that which changes or tends to change the state of rest or motion of an object. The SI units is a Newton. Force is actually mass into acceleration. What is pressure? Pressure is force applied over a unit area. And the SI units is Pascals. Actually, Pascal is a very small unit, so we use kilopascals for pressures. Energy is a capacity to do work. It's measured in joules. And actually, work is basically said to be done when force is moved through a distance. So, work is force into distance. Now, we have pressure is force upon area and work is force into distance. So, substitution of the whole, we get work done is pressure into volume. And that is, this is the basis of the curves which we refer in the monitors. You can see from the graph on the right, depicts the pressure volume curve of respiration, inspiration and expiration, and the area under the curve is the work done during respiration. Similarly, the cardiac cycle is shown and you can calculate the area of loop that indicates the stroke work. Coming to hydrostatic pressures, manometers and barometers measure pressure using a column of fluid. This is done by balancing the unknown pressure against the pressure produced by the weight of the column of fluid. Barometer uses liquid mercury or manometer it's water for the cvp we use water for the blood pressure we used to use sigma manometer with mercury in those days this is the mercury where you have an inverted tube you can see the atmospheric pressure balances the height of the mercury column here and there is a vacuum on top which is called a torricelli vacuum basically it has nothing but vapor of mercury it's not internal here the pressure is force upon area which is equal to the weight of mercury column divided by the cross sectional area given by the form height into rho into gravity and by calculating thus we get the atmospheric pressure as 101.4 kPa. So this is the absolute pressure which is uh, telling. Now we come to two things which is a gauge pressure and absolute pressure. Gauge pressure is basically uh, above the atmospheric pressure value. So whenever you are talking about gauge pressure means it's atmospheric pressure plus the pressure which is shown. So when unknown pressure is relative to atmospheric pressure, the value is referred to as gauge pressure. We measure blood pressure, airway measurement pressure, everything as a gauge pressure. Whereas the absolute pressure is relative to vacuum. So the barometric pressure uh, basically is the absolute pressure measurement. So, there is a favorite question for the examiners because they'll ask you equivalence of pressure. So, this is very important. One bar is equal to one atmospheric pressure is equal to 14.5 pounds per inch square, which is equal to 101.4 kPa, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, 
which is equal to 1020 centimeters of water. So when you calculate what how many kilopascals makes conversions of mercury in millimeters is 760 millimeters is equal to 101.4 kPa. So 1 kPa is equal to 7.49 millimeters of mercury and 1 millimeters of mercury is equal to 0 0.133 kilopascals. So if the examiner asks you to convert millimeters of mercury in kilopascals or vice versa, you multiply or divide. Now, coming to the force required while using a syringe. Now, this syringe, when you are giving a force, there is a pressure which is developed inside the syringe. And that is given by either force divided by the area, that is a pressure, or the force is equal to pressure into cross-sectional area. Now, depending on the size of the syringe, the pressure developed or generated is high or low depending on a constant force which is done. So if we use a 2 ml syringe and we have a constant force of 25 newtons pressed at the end, the 2 ml syringe will have a smaller cross-sectional area. So the pressure generated is 500 kilopascals. Whereas for a 20 ml syringe, the cross-sectional area is good. So the pressure is force upon area, which area is big. So the pressure generated is lower, 100 kilopascals. But even this pressure is 6 times more than the systolic blood pressure of the patient. So, what is the applied importance? So, if we are doing a bias bl block, we have to we use a big syringe and a big volume. So, you have to be careful. You have to choose a vein which is distal to the systolic blood pressure cuff and inject slowly so that the vein doesn't rupture and the rapid injection can exceed the systolic pressure and it can get absorbed into the circulation. If you are going to use a 2 ml syringe, the pressure generated is very high. So, you have to take uh, caution that you don't cause tissue damage. Similarly, if you don't choose the right size of the cuff, if you choose a small width blood pressure cuff, the pressure generated will be high, erroneously high. And if you use a large width cuff, the pressure will be falsely low. So you have to use the right size of BP cuff to measure the correct pressures. Another applied importance of this pressure is when a patient is lying in a bed for a prolonged time, the point of contacts in the bed are small areas which are contact in the bed where the whole force of the body is acting and on a small area. So the pressure is acting on the small, the force is acting on a small area. So the pressure developed is quite high, which stops the blood flow. And this causes ischemia and then the skin uh, becomes necrotic and then it ulcerates and there are several stages of bed sores and this is important to treat. So you have to make sure if a patient is not mobile, so you have to give them water bed or you know air mattress and change the postures regularly to prevent pressure sores. Otherwise they will end up in bad pressure sores and they it gets infected and it's actually adding to the mortality and morbidity of that patient. Now coming to gas loss. First, what is a gas? So basically a gas is defined as a substance that exists above its critical temperature. So the next question is, what is critical temperature? You all know that the gases can be pressurized and cooled. And when they are pressurized and cooled, the volume shrinks and the gases turns into the next state, which is the liquid state. So by increasing pressure or cooling, you can convert a gas to a liquid. However, there is a temperature above which any gas cannot be liquefied by whatever increase you increase the pressure. And this is called the critical temperature of a particular gas. So for oxygen, it is minus 119 degrees centigrade. And for nitrous, it is 36.5 degrees Celsius. Then comes what is critical pressure and volume. So the minimum pressure at critical temperature required to liquefy, liquefy a gas is called the critical pressure. And the critical volume is the volume occupied by one mole of a gas at its critical pressure and temperature. Now, pointing effect or over pressure effect. When two gases, one with a high and another with a low critical temperature are mixed in a container, the critical temperature of both the gases comes to a lower level and it is called a pseudo-critical temperature. 
and it, the mixture will remain as a gas above this temperature. This effect is called pointing effect. Now, Entonox is a 50-50 uh, equivolume of oxygen and nitrous and when they are mixed, the pseudocritical temperature is minus 6 degrees Celsius at 137 bars and this is stored as a gas. So, if the, this Entonox is cooled below this temperature, the nitrous oxide and oxygen will separate and this process is called lamination. So, Entonox has to be kept horizontal and stored above its pseudocritical temperature especially between 10 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius. What is an ideal gas? It is a theoretical concept where the gas behaves as individual particles and move in a random fashion and there is no molecular intermolecular force of attraction at standard temperature and pressures. This concept is useful because it obeys the ideal gas laws but most of the gases don't behave as an ideal gas. So the gas laws, Boyle's law states that at a constant temperature, the volume of a fixed amount of a perfect gas varies inversely with its pressure. So it's illustrated in the graph shown here. Charles law says that at constant pressure, the volume is directly proportional to the temperature. So this is shown in the figure. Gay Lussac's law states that at constant volume, the pressure is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. To remember these laws, we can have a tip, boils, water boils at constant temperature and Prince Charles was under constant pressure to become a king. Of course, now he has become a king. Now the ideal gas equation is a combination of all the three laws which comes as pressure into volume divided by temperature becomes a constant and that becomes PV is equal to NRT where N is the number of moles of gas present and R is a universal gas constant. Now why this ideal gas equation is important? Because when we have cylinders which contains gases, they follow this ideal gas equation and we can calculate from here the volume of gas present at a particular pressure because the cylinder is present at a constant room temperature the cylinder volume is fixed and r is constant so we have pressure is directly proportional to n so that is the volume can be easily calculated by knowing the pressures for example uh, we have an oxygen cylinder with a volume of 10 liters and the pressure is 138 bars and so we want to know how much gas it will contain when it is delivered at one atmospheric pressure. So we have P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Supplementing we get V2 is 1380 liters. That's the uh, volume of gas you are going to get from there. So our day-to-day -day activities we have Boyle's law, the process of breathing. We breathe in tidal volume increases and there is a fall in pressures and vice versa and this Oxygen cylinder and carbon dioxide which are present as gas, they have got this pressure gauge which tells you absolutely the amount of gas present in. By looking at the pressures, you can easily calculate the volume. Now, medical gases are stored in cylinders which have a constant volume and they are stored at a very high pressures. So if they are going to be exposed to very high temperatures, there will be further rise in pressures and that might cause explosions. As a result of which, cylinders are made up of molybdenum steel which can withstand a pressure up to 210 bars. So if there is a damage in cylinder or anything occurs, there is a great risk for explosion. Similarly, the pipeline pressures have to be maintained at 4 bar. Now, that was for a gas. Now we have cylinders with liquids like nitrous oxide. How do we calculate the amount of gas which is there in the cylinder? Here we have to use Avogadro's hypothesis which says that one mole of a gas or vapor contains the same number of molecules and one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure. So the mole of nitrous is 44 grams 
equal molars 32 grams of oxygen and 28 grams of nitrogen. Now, applying this Avogadro's principle, we have to take the empty weight of the nitrous cylinder and the cylinder with the gas. The empty weight is called tar weight. Now, coming to that, uh, if we have the tar weight of the cylinder as 5 points, uh, if the weight of the nitrous uh, is 5.6 kilograms and the empty cylinder is 4.5 kilograms, by subtracting, we have the amount of nitrous as 1.1 kilograms. So, we can say 44 grams of nitrous will occupy 22.4 liters. So, 1.1 kilogram will occupy. That comes to 560 liters. Now, this is at standard temperature. Now, if you want to calculate at a room temperature, then you have to apply the Charles law over here and add the temperature from 273 at 20, which makes it 293 kelvins. And now, you know, at 273 kelvins, it is 560 liters, 293 Kelvin, it has to be 6.1 liters. So if we give 2 liters, we know it lasts anything approximately 4 to 5 hours. Dalton's law is a law of partial pressure, which states that when you have individual gas occupying the same volume, each gas exerts a pressure. Say for example, gas A has pressure A, gas B has pressure B, and gas C has pressure C. Now, when you combine all these three gases together in the same container, the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures as if the gas would occupy the empty space alone. So, P total is PA plus PB plus PC. Now, the applications of this Dalton's law is daily we have exchange which occurs oxygen from the atmosphere to the mitochondria. And so it depends on the partial pressure from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. And that is exactly what is happening with us. And the, on the right hand side, we have uh, the oxygen cascade, which is very important. Asked in the exams, why there is a drop in the pressures? What happens? Initial drop is because of humidification. Next drop is because of mixture with CO2. Then the next drop is because of diffusion, VQ mismatch and physiological intrusions. Then you have extraction of oxygen from the blood. From the, in the capillaries, it goes to the metabolism. And finally, that is the pasture point. So the examiner, they ask what is the pasture point? That is a minimum PO2, PA uh, oxygen, at which the mitochondrial functions. Again, the application of pressurized uh, oxygen partial pressure comes here with a carbon monoxide poisoning where you keep the patients on a compressed oxygen, a pressurized oxygen chamber with high pressures for them to recover from the carbon monoxide poisoning. Similarly, there is a question which is asked in the exam by some of the examiners that at what uh, target would you set your pulse oximeter alarm? For example, uh, in this oxyhemoglobin dissolution curve, you see that uh, the saturation of 95.8 uh, and more is a flat curve. From 90, uh, below, from 94 uh, to 90, there is a small uh, drop in the pressures. But when it comes below 90, there is a steep fall in the PA, oxygen pressure. So your ideal alarm limit should be set at 94, so that when it decreases by from 94 to 90, you have some time to quickly act. If you set the alarm at 90, then you don't have time to act because there is a steep fall. So the its right answer would be, I would set the alarm uh, limit as 94 in a pulse oximeter. Again, the application of partial pressure uh, as you go above the sea level to Mount Everest, the barometric pressure reduces to nearly half. Uh, so at Mount Everest, the barometric pressure is 253 millimeters of mercury. But if you, so when you calculate the percentage of oxygen, nitrous, everything will be the same proportion. So when you calculate and replace it, it will be much lesser than 159. So the driving pressure of oxygen is less. So you need some oxy, uh, pressurized oxygen cylinder to keep you while going on trekking or you need some oxygen support. And this is the basis of uh, mountaineering. Adiabatic compression or expansion of gases. This is also called the Joule-Kelvin principle or Joule-Thompson effect. Basically, when applied, uh, to expansion or compression of gases, energy is not added or removed when the changes occur. So, how do we come to know? Say we use a cycle pump to 
uh, put air into the cycle tires while you're using the pump you touch the cycle pump you will feel it is hot this is when compression occurs and the temperature rises similarly if you use a cryo precipitate probe it comes uh, liquid nitrous uh, nitrogen comes through a you know a small uh, probe and immediately the temperature is lowered and that leads to cryo cauteries next comes what is a vapor and what is a gas a gas is above its critical temperature and usually it is a substance which remains in a gaseous state at room temperature and atmospheric pressure whereas a vapor is normally a liquid at room temperature and atmospheric pressure and so uh, it it's uh, since its critical temperature is above the room temperature what is evaporation evaporation is when a liquid volatile liquid starts evaporating into vapor that is evaporation the same process when applies to a solid for example a camphor it is called sublimation so uh, this if you put a small volatile liquid into a closed chamber there will always be and fill it half there will be some particles which gradually escapes and there will be a vapor which is building above the liquid and it will exert a pressure and once the equilibrium is established that is called a saturated vapor pressure now the saturated vapor pressure gradually increases if you put heat provide heat the vapor pressure saturated vapor pressure will increase 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 until the liquid starts boiling when it reaches the atmospheric pressure so the boiling point is nothing but when the saturated vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure so the boiling point of halothane is 50 degrees centigrade at 20 degrees centigrade the saturated vapor pressure is 243 millimeters mercury and at svp it is 760 millimeters of mercury the left side shows you the svps and the volume percentage in uh, the vaporizing chamber at 20 degrees centigrade now special look at the saver desflurent the saturated vapor pressure is quite high and the uh, amount of vapor in the uh, chamber is 87 percent so you need a special vaporizer to carry for desflurent. Uh, similarly, the boiling point of desflurent is 23.5. So you need it's it will boil even below room temperature. So you need a special vaporizer to have heating, and that will give you the vaporizer for desflurent. Now, the applied importance of all these things is you need specialized vaporizers for certain agents. Now, when you go to high altitude, because the atmospheric pressure is reduced, the uh, percentage delivered concentration will be doubled but the vapor pressure will remain same so and the anesthesia being uh, related to partial pre uh, pressure at the alveoli which is equal to the brain tension so there is no change in anesthesia and things but the concentration delivered by the vaporizer will be doubled then the examiner asks you again whether you can use uh, uh, isofluorin vaporizer can you fill it with any other agent yes Theoretically, it should be not done. Each vaporizer is ideal for the same agent and it's agent specific. But in case of is, uh, technically, yes, if they share the same vapor, approximately the saturated vapor pressure is same, the vaporizer will function in the, exactly the same way. For example, halothane and isofluorine, the vapor, saturated vapor pressure is very close, 239 and 243. So you can fill them. Uh, similarly, n fluorine and sevofluorine shares very close. So you can, but ideally you should not. Azeotrope is a mixture of two or more liquids whose components cannot be separated by distillation. So halothane and ether forms an azeotrope mixture when mixed in a ratio of 2 is to 1 by volume. Now, coming to the last part of my talk, resonance and damping. Now, every system has a tendency to oscillate at its maximum amplitude at certain frequencies. This is the resonant frequencies and this is determined by the mass and stiffness of a system. When the mass is higher, there is slower oscillations. When the stiffer is the system, there is faster oscillations. I'll come to you with some examples of it. Now you can see on the right, there is a Carnatic vocal singer who tunes the Tanpura. Now this Tanpura has got four strings each string is of a different weight and different texture. 
So the string has to be tightened and the set to the natural frequencies and finally they adjust uh, with a small st uh, string uh, with a small thread to get the maximum frequency and then all are aligned to a particular note and when they pitch it it's a perfect pitch so this is the idea of a resonance at the natural frequency resonant frequency when you re really get the right pitch on the left you have on the right you have the swing basically a child is swinging so the swing has its own frequency now you can increase the swing by somebody pushing from behind and then the child really swings very quite high now if the child wants to reduce its swinging what will the child do it has to put its feet on the floor and that is called damping the frictional force and we'll come to it again damping is the resistance of the system and it's a result of a frictional force acting on it and a decrease in amplitude of oscillation is a result of energy loss so the frequency of oscillation for that object uh, when set in motion with some energy that is the frequency you all have also it's a uh, you witnessed when the lorry engine starts the window pane shakes that's again because of the natural frequency and resonance so with the natural frequency we have if you draw it the output on uh, one axis and the frequency on the other you have a sine wave gradually increasing in amplitude and again smalling the maximum amplitude at which the oscillation occurs is called the resonant frequency. We have a degree of damping which is desirable. So the damping ranges from 0 where no damping occurs to 1 where critical damping occurs. And then we have the response time and the rise time uh, for each to reach its 90% of the final reading and from 10 to 90%. Now zero damping, when there is a change, there is no change in the uh, frequency or uh, oscillations. That is absolutely zero damping. The system is undamped. What is underdamped? When you put a change, there is a change and so the, it touches the baseline. Gradually reduces, touches the baseline. So this is underdamped, where the damping coefficient ranges from 0 to 0 0.3. Overdamped is it never touches the baseline with gradually progressing. So this is more than one. This is not suitable for a system. Critical damping is a degree of damping which allows most rapid attainment to a new input combined with no overshoot. And the damping coefficient is one. Okay. But we want something called optimal damping. This is the most suitable combination to a response to a change where the damping coefficient is 0.64. So the response is fairly rapid with not more than two oscillations around the baseline before attaining the new value. This level of damping is desired in the modern measuring systems. So this is a graph which combines all the things. You have a critical damping, the optimal damping, the under damping and the over damped. So the applied importance is when you have invasive blood pressures, you need a short stiff white cannula there should not be much connections in the systems and there should not be any air bubbles which causes resistance. And thank you for your patient listening. Okay. Uh, now we go to uh, the next speaker, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show the next speaker is Dr. Vinodini. Uh, she is a senior consultant, a very brilliant girl, have won several gold medals in her undergraduate and postgraduate examinations. She does our pediatric anesthesia and obstetric anesthesia. She is a wonderful uh, colleague to work with, has got several papers, and very interested in academics. So I'll invite Dr. Sarva Vinodini to speak on flow-related physics. Thank you, Dr. Vinodini. Dr. Vinodini. One second, sir. One second, one second, sir. No problems. You take your screen and share it. I'm not able to go full screen.
Yeah, is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, it's so, visible. Doctor uh, Vinodni, if you could just you know share the whole desktop. Yes, sir. Is my than, screen? Yeah. Now. Yeah, is it visible, sir? Yes, it is visible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, today's topic of discussion is regarding flow-related physics. In the in the verge of this discussion, you will come to know the application of the flow-related physics in the operation of modular OT, in the management of laryngeal edema, in the usage of heliox, in the usage of flow meters, the application of flow-related physics in the testing of vein circuit, and in the physiological anemia of pregnancy. Fanta Ray is a Greek phrase that was told by Heraclitus, a pre socratic philosopher, which means everything flows. Everything flows if given enough time. What is a fluid? A fluid is a liquid, gas, or any other material that can continuously deform or continuously flow when a tangential force or a shear force is being applied to it. What is flow? It is a quantity of a fluid that passes through a point per unit time. Flow is defined as a quantity divided by the time. There are three factors that govern the fluid flow, the speed of the flow, the shape of the solid surface over which it's flowing, the characteristics of the fluid per se, the viscosity, density, and the compressibility of the fluid. Broadly, we can have two patterns of fluid flow, that is laminar or a turbulent flow. Laminar flow occurs like this, more organized, more parallel. It occurs in layers. There is no mixing in between. Whereas a turbulent fluid is like this, so erratic and chaotic with, uh, with the fluid going on in numerous directions in between. So as we saw, a laminar flow goes in layers and that is, the, that is why the name laminar flow. And it also occurs in smooth sheets of continuous lines or streamlined flows are the name. The fluid, happens, uh, fluid flow happens in layers and the layers do not mix with each other. And the maximal velocity is towards the center. Comparing with the turbulent flow, here it is so disorganized and chaotic, the particles move in different directions to each other, and a lot of eddies are formed. These are called as eddies. Comparing the velocity profile, we can see that the laminar flow has a steady velocity profile, a steady velocity, whereas the turbulent flow has lots of fluctuations over the mean. What is the clinical implication? The operation theaters that we function day in and day out, our operation theaters employ laminar airflow. Why? Because if you see in a laminar airflow, as we discussed, the velocity is going to be maximal at the center. That is the place where the operating uh, surgeons operate on the patient. So if you see here, because the velocity is high here, in the regions one to three, you can see in this graph, there is hardly any particles there. The particle concentration increases towards the periphery. Because of the laminar flow, there is this dispersion occurs, and this operating environment becomes more sterile. So laminar flow helps in the, in the operation of the modular OTs in keeping the mi operating microenvironment sterile. So laminar flow helps in keeping the operating microenvironment sterile, the external environment. It also helps in maintaining the internal uh, vascular microenvironment also. How? You can see here, because the laminar flow is having a steady flow, the shear stress of the laminar flow acts as an antithrombotic agent and anti-migratory agent, it inhibits growth, whereas the turbulent flow, where it where you have a low mean shear stress or where you have an oscillatory kind of flow, you can see uh, thrombosis occurring or uh, plaque formation occurring here because it is, is prothrombotic, it promotes migration, and it causes apoptosis and vein wall damage. So laminar flow is more favorable because it, it decreases permeability and proliferation. It increases the vasodilator concentration. It increases the antithrombotic effect. Whereas the, uh, when there is a turbulent flow, it, it becomes more atherogenic. And we can see even in carotid arteries, the plaques form at the region where there is turbulent flow. Coming to the pressure flow relationship. The linear laminar flow, the flow is directly proportional to the driving pressure. It is a linear relationship, meaning if you're going to increase the pressure gradient, the flow rate increases proportionately. What happens with turbulent flow? With turbulent flow also, the flow increases proportionately. But if you see, the flow increases less when compared to that with the laminar flow, because here the flow is directly proportional to the square root of the driving pressure. So what is the implication for this? Laminar flow requires lower pressure to achieve the same flow rate. 
as compared to the turbulent flow. So what? So laminar flow requires lesser energy to achieve the same flow as compared to the turbulent flow. What is the implication of this? Because laminar flow has, requires lower driving pressure and reduced work needs to be done. So reduced work needs to be done, be it the heart or the lung. With, re with regard to the respiration, when there is a laminar flow, the work of breathing that is required is less. When the flow becomes turbulent with, uh, due to any, any cause of airway obstructions like asthma or any other organic obstruction also, there is an increased work of breathing. Similarly, in circulation also, the flow is predominantly laminar in all the long and straight blood vessels under steady flow conditions. So this reduces the work that the heart has to perform. When this flow becomes turbulent, lots of energy losses occur and the heart has to uh, do more work. Turbulent flow also makes noise. This we can see in the, in the measurement of the blood pressure, the Korotokov sounds that we hear. So when the VP cuff is inflated beyond the systolic blood pressure, the brachial artery is narrowed and we don't hear any sound. When the cuff is between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, the brachial artery is compressed and there is a turbulent flow that occurs, which leads to the Korotokov sounds. And when the, when the BP cuff is pressurized less than the diastolic pressure, the brachial artery compression is relieved and the laminar flow resumes. And so there's no, no more sounds that are heard. So turbulent flow aids in the Korotokov sounds. Similarly, turbulent flow causes the sounds that we hear as murmurs. When the flow is laminar across a valve, the flow is usually quiet. We don't hear any sound. When the, when the flow occurs through a stenosed valve, turbulence ensures, and that is heard as a murmur. Similarly, a leaky valve also produces turbulence, which is heard as a murmur. How does a laminar flow get on to a turbulent flow? So we can see here in this video that laminar flow occurs so organized way occurs in layers, there is no mixing up of fluids. But if you watch carefully, you can see there are some outbursts that are happening over the course. So slowly and slowly, we can see the disturbance occurring in these layers. And these layers go and tend to make other layers. And we get to have the turbulent flow here. We can have eddies And these lead on to the turbulent flow. So what happens here? Laminar flow, when it reaches a certain point, that is what we saw in the diagnosis. Laminar flow gets on to a turbulent flow once a certain threshold is reached. What is the threshold and how do we determine it? That can be determined using Reynolds number. Whenever the Reynolds number is less than 2000, the flow is predominantly laminar. When it is between 2000 and 4000, we saw the small outburst that happened. And when it is beyond 4000, the flow was entirely chaotic and a complete turbulent flow ensured. What is Reynolds number? It was described by Osborne Reynolds. It is just a ratio, it doesn't have any unit. So this is the formula given for the Reynolds number. The factors uh, influencing Reynolds number are the density of the fluid, the viscosity of the fluid, the velocity and the diameter. So this is the Reynolds number. The two most important factors here are the density and the viscosity of the fluid. Reynolds number, in fact, can also be told as a ratio of a fluid density to its viscosity or the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. So when it is less than 2000, the flow is laminar, no mixing happening. When it is beyond 4000, it is an entirely turbulent flow with lots of chaos. What is viscosity then? Viscosity is a measurement of the fluid's resistance to flow. Water flows easily when compared to honey. So water is less viscous. Why does this happen? Because the intermolecular attraction in water is less when compared to that of honey. So water flows easily when compared to more viscous honey. And what is density? It is a mass of substance that occupies a unit volume. Both have the same volume, but the mass here is more. So this is highly dense. So honey is more dense when compared with water and oil is less dense when compared with water. So oil floats. Why is viscosity and density important for us? Because viscosity affects laminar flow and density affects turbulent flow. This is a very important uh, concept. So I'm repeating it again. Viscosity affects laminar flow and density affects turbulent flow. 
Hagen Poiseuille's law describes the lamina flow that occurs through a tube. So this is Hagen Poiseuille's law where Q is a flow rate. It is, it is uh, equal to pi into this pressure differential, radius raised to the power of four, eight, viscosity into length. So Hagen's Poiseuille's law is affected by the attributes of the tube, that is the length of the tube and the radius of the tube. And the flow is also affected by the attributes of the fluid per se, which is the viscosity of the fluid and the pressure differential that occurs along the tube. This is a very important law that we knowingly or unknowingly use day in and day out, the hagen poiseuille law. Let us, uh, let us evaluate each and every factor that is operating on the hagen poiseuille law. First, the numerators. The first thing that you're going to see is the uh, pressure differential. So if you see the pressure differential, flow is directly proportional to the pressure difference. How do we employ this daily? Whenever we have to increase the flow rate of the IV fluid, we raise the height of the IV stand, or we use a pressure bag uh, to pressurize the IV fluids, or we use a rapid infusing, rapid infusers. All these, all these increase the pressure difference and aid in the increased flow of the fluids. The next factor in the numerator is radius. Radius raised to the power of four. Uh, even the, this is very important because this factor is raised to the power of four. So flow is directly proportional to the radius raised to the power of four. So when you are going to increase the radius, the flow is going to increase to the power of four. Or when you are going to reduce the radius, the flow is going to reduce to the power of four. When the flow is reduced, it means the resistance to flow is increased. So this concept comes into play during the airway edema, which we see in children. Uh, this is more predominant in infants because we are, we are more bothered about the airway edema in infants because they have a very small diameter airway. A one millimeter edema that occurs in an infant will cause a, re a reduction of the uh, radius by half. If it's going to reduce the radius by half, the flow is going to reduce by 16 times or the resistance is going to reduce, it is going to increase by 16 times because it is radius raised to the power of four. So flow is going, flow is going to uh, reduce by 16 times and resistance is going to increase 16 times. The same one millimeter edema hardly causes greater impact in an adult. So that is why we are so bothered about airway edema in children. Similarly, when we select the IV cannulas also, we, we, we try to select a bigger gauge cannula when we want to give large amounts of fluid. Here we can see the flow rate increases as the external diameter of the cannula increases just a 0.5 millimeter increase in the external diameter doubles the flow rate in an IV cannula. Similarly, the endotracheal tubes that we select, we tend to select a wider or bigger size endotracheal tubes to increase the flow rate of gas through that or to reduce the flow rate of gases through that. Having seen the numerators, now it's a denominator. Length, flow is inversely proportional to the length. How is this important? Though the gauge of the cannula is yeah, safe, yeah, well, we tend to use the shorter IV cannula know, know, to, to infuse large amounts of fluids as compared to the longer quick line or the longer central line for resuscitating uh, with fluids. Why? Because even though you can see all are 14 gauge, all these three are 14 gauge cannula. This is a 15 centimeter cannula and this is a 14 centimeter. So you can see the difference in the flow rate, 117 versus 197. And this is just five centimeter. If you compare five centimeter versus 15 centimeter, the flow rate is more than double. So we prefer shorter IV cannula for more flow rather than the longer uh, pick line or central line, provided both have the same radius. Similarly, we resort to tracheostomy to aid weaning of a patient who are on prolonged mechanical ventilation, just because this reduction in length offers a reduced work of breathing in them. The next factor in the denominator is the viscosity. Flow is inversely proportional to the viscosity. Anemia and pregnancy, uh, the pregnant, the, uh, there is a physiological change that occurs in pregnancy. There's physiological anemia of pregnancy. Why is that important? Because of the physiological anemia of, in pregnancy, when the hematocrit drips, the viscosity of the blood also drops. Because viscosity, lower viscosity aids in increased flow, this lower viscosity, because of the physiological anemia in pregnancy, helps in increased flow of blood to the uterus and to the fetus. We also use this uh, in bringing out the secretions. We use mucolytic agents to reduce the viscosity of the secretion so that it can be easily flowed out or this can be easily brought out. As Hagen-Poiseuille's law governed lamina flow, Graham's law governs 
turbulent flow. According to Graham's law, flow is inversely proportional to the square root of density. How are we using this? We use heliox. Whenever there is absolute, uh, absolute no airflow or limited airflow in a croup or laryngotracheal bronchitis, we can see here how, how edematous the airway here is. You can't imagine air to go through this, but heliox might pass through this because though heliox has a viscosity that is similar to air, the density is six times lower than air. As we saw, according to Graham's law, the turbulent flow is, inverse, uh, is inversely proportional to the square root of the density. So because the density is less, the flow is going to be more. So because of lower turbulence, lower resistance, there'll be better airflow with heliox as compared with air in such situations. But remember, heliox still can provide only 21% oxygen. If you need more oxygen, we'll have to resort to some other method. Nick, the clinical application of the laminar flow and the uh, turbulent flow happens in top tube also. Top tube is a variable uh, variable orifice flow meter that, that uh, we constantly use day in and day out in our anesthesia missions. So here, the diameter of the tube varies. It is narrower here towards the end, it's, and it's, a tape, it's tapered here and it's broader at the top. So when at lower flows, what happens here, this uh, part of the tube behaves like, a, uh, this, this annulus behaves like a tube because the length is more than the diameter. And here we have the laminar flow. And so the flow of the gas here is dependent on the viscosity. So it's going to be governed by Hagen's Poiseuille's law. When it goes higher, here we can see this annulus behaves like an orifice because the diameter is going to be bigger than the length. So here turbulent flow ensures, and that is going to be dependent on density according to Graham's law. Can the same flow meter be used for different gases? Like if you're going to use oxygen and nitrous, but the nitrous flow meter is broken, can we instead use the as flow meter as a replacement here? Can it be done? It cannot be done because as we saw here, the flow, flow meter, uh, both kinds of flow ensures here, turbulent and laminar, and the density and the viscosity of the gas is important in the calibration because all gases have different kinds of density and viscosity. If you are going to use the same flow meter to a different one, the actual flows will be varying. So each flow meter is calibrated for a specific gas according to its density and viscosity. What about using the flow meter at high altitudes? At high altitudes, the barometric pressure is less. We can see here the density of gas is more at sea level as compared to that of the, at high altitudes. So as we know, Graham's law governs density so when the density is low, the flow is going to be more. According to Graham's law, the flow is going to be uh, inversely proportional to the square root of density. So because at high altitudes, when the density is low and you're going to use high flow rates, as we saw here, it's going to be operated by Graham's law. So what will happen? The actual flow that you're going to, that you're going to keep on the flow meter is going to be higher than what you have actually set on the flow meter. Like, see here, because the density of gas increases at high altitudes, what happens? If you're going to set a flow rate of five liters, it will actually be delivering six liters. So it happens with both uh, nitrous oxide and oxygen. Your flow meter will actually underread whatever gas is uh, being delivered. What is a hazard? As long as you're using 50% concentration of nitrous oxide and 50% concentration of oxygen, it's not an issue because the flow is going, flow is, flow is going to be increased for both. But, but if you're going to use a higher concentration of nitrous oxide, like 70% of uh, nitrous oxide versus 30% of oxygen, we will be having even higher concentrations of nitrous oxide. So we, there is a danger of delivering a hypoxic mixture. So if you're going to use uh, the flow meters at high altitudes, it's preferable not to go beyond 50% concentration of nitrous oxide and even more preferable to use an oxygen analyzer. According to the continuity equation, the uh, mass of the fluid that enters A1 at a particular point of time should be equal to the mass of the fluid that exits A2 at that particular point of time. But when a tube narrows, we can see that the same volume occupies more area in the narrowed part of the tube as compared to the wider part of the tube. So what happens so for the law of conservation of mass to be justified, the velocity of the uh, gas or the fluid has to increase in the narrower portion of the tube. So when the tube narrows, the velocity here increases a lot. So for the same mass to point uh, to pass through these two points at the same period of time, the velocity of the fluid has to increase in the narrower portion. This 
is uh, this extrapolation comes into the Bernoulli's principle also. According to Bernoulli's principle, the, the sum of the kinetic and the potential energy should be same throughout at any point of time. So here we saw earlier that in the, in the broader part of the tube, the velocity is less as compared to the narrower part of the tube. So here, because the velocity is less, the kinetic energy is less. So the potential energy or the pressure is going to be more. But what happens in the narrower side, as we saw here, the speed increases. So the velocity increases, so the kinetic energy increases. So then what will happen to the potential energy? It has to reduce. So an increase in speed of a fluid occurs with a simultaneous reduction in the pressure. That is the Bernoulli's principle. So Bernoulli described this in his uh, uh, book, Hydronomica in 1738. He showed that a liquid or a gas will create less pressure when its velocity increases. So a liquid or a gas will create less pressure when its velocity increases. And this is the Bernoulli's principle. The Venturi effect is an extrapolation or the consequence of the Bernoulli's principle. The key here is, here there is a constriction, there is a narrowing, wherein your velocity is going to increase and there is going to be a pressure drop. The entrainment of air or the fluid is the key principle in Venturi effect. So when there is a pressure drop, if you allow a place for the air or the fluid to get entrained, then it can easily be entrained at the pressure drop. What is, more, what is even more interesting is, the pressure drop can be, uh, we can even ad adjust the diameter of the constriction and, and we can even control the pressure drop. This was described by Venturi. I would request you to remember these two years for just uh, three or four more slides. It was first described by Venturi in 1797. He is an Italian uh, scientist. His full name is Giovanni Battista Venturi. This was his paper that he published in 1797. This was translated into English in 1836. So 1797 and 1836, if you can remember for two, three more slides. This is a video describing the Venturi effect. Here we can see as the tube narrows, the velocity increases. And we saw as the velocity increase, increases, the pressure has to decrease. And so it will suck in air or fluid, whatever is available. The clinical application of this we use in the Venturi mask, wherein uh, it is color coded for uh, different kinds of the uh, constrictions, different kinds of the constriction that allows different types of the pressure drop uh, that allows the varying degrees of entrainment of the room air. So according to that, so like, uh, for example, a yellow venturi mask with an uh, oxygen flow of eight liters per minute, wherein uh, air is entrained, the net output is going to be around 44 liters. So it's almost 36 liters of air entrained. And we, we, we can thus determine the FiO2 concentration more or less accurately. So because the diameter of the constriction is uh, already predetermined, the entrainment can be calculated. And hence, these venturi masks deliver a fixed concentration of FiO2. Here we can see we just, we just gave in 8 liters. But what we get out is around 44 liters, the 36 being room air entrainment. So that amounts to 35%. So similarly, we can extrapolate for all the various color-coded venturi masks also. So the clinical effect of uh, the clinical applications of this venturi uh, effect is we see we see it in venturi mask, we see it in nebulizer also, where the special drop is used to entrain the uh, fluid, and also in checking of the uh, veins integrity of the vein circuit, the pethix test. Uh, the, when the inner tube is intact and we activate the oxygen flush, the reservoir back collapses because when oxygen uh, when the oxygen flush is activated, the air goes through this inner tube. And because uh, the air passes on through this into the narrower constrictions, the uh, room, uh, the, the air that is present on the outer circuit, uh, outer part of the vein circuit is also entrained. So that will lead on to the collapse of this uh, reservoir back when the inner tube is intact. But what will happen if the inner tube is damaged, we cannot find any, uh, we cannot find the uh, reservoir back to be collapsed. The reservoir back will still be uh, filled. So this is the test. To, uh, this is to test the integrity of the inner tube in vein circuit, also called as the pethix test. The venturi effect is also used in jet ventilators and injectors. Coanda effect, it was described by uh, Henry Coanda. He was a Roman aircraft engineer. He states that any fluid that is coming in contact with a curved surface will cling to the surface and alter the direction of its flow. How does this occur? This part we know, we have already seen, this is the venturi effect. When the jet of air com comes in, uh, the velocity increases, the pressure reduces, and so air is entrained. A low pressure area is created on both sides that is being compensated by the atmospheric pressure. But here, if you're going to place on some surface, some solid surface here, 
there is no place for a, a, a atmospheric care to come and negotiate this so atmospheric care will act here only so here this low pressure will still be there so this uh, fluid column will be pressurized to rest on this white surface or to cling on to this white surface this is the quant effect and if and if this surface is going to be curved this clinging is going to be even more, even more prominent because here you have a low pressure vortex happening that will suck in so this will this is the reason of the quant effect what is the application of this whenever a constriction occurs at the point of bifurcation the fluid will tend to cling to one side of the branch and will not be distributed evenly towards two branches like if there is any obstruction happening here the fluid might tend to cling to any one of these branches what is the implication if there is any mucus plug that is present at the bifurcations of the tracheobronchial tree or if there is any atheroma that is present at the bifurcations of the vessels the 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 gas or the blood might preferentially take one branch and might not be equally distributed in two branches this principle is also used in numerous ventilators this is a new field ventilator it's a transport ventilator this principle uh, with this principle the fluid logic ventilators thus created you can replace the valve or the mobile parts making it even easier for transportation so we have seen all these uh, physical principles that are acting uh, the such a beautiful interplay of all these physical effects that we have seen is seen in phonation whereas wherein all the effects that we have seen plays in such a harmony for us to speak so it it employs almost all the effects that we have discussed till now this is so interesting right even more fascinating is the usage of this principle by our indian people by our ancestors so this is hawa mahal that is present in jaipur and rajasthan this was built uh, by uh, ustad lalchand an architect for savai pratap singh this was built between 1795 to 1799 if you remember i asked you to just hold on to those dates venturi effect was first published in italian language in 1797 but this was constructed even before that venturi effect was translated in english in 1836 but this was in construction even before that why is this important this acts as a natural air conditioner in the hot desert of rajasthan by means of these 953 jarokas or the windows that are present in this hawa mahal when air comes in through this through this narrow passage the velocity of the air is going to increase and the pressure reduces when the pressure reduces through all these perforations that are present even more air is entrained in so this plays their role of a natural air conditioner hawa means air in hindi so this is aptly called as a hawa mahal which has employed venturi effect even before venturi effect was published this is interesting right even more fascinating is this kumari tumbu this is a construction that is present deep inside the lakes here this is the this is a stone that will usually that will usually be covering this inlet this is a construction that is present deep inside the lakes this is to divert this channel is to divert the water in the lakes to the irrigating fields or the canals so this will usually be sealed so when when the water has to be sent for irrigation this is lifted this is lifted when this is lifted this stone gets lifted when this stone gets lifted water enters into this stone channel and water goes on through this irrigation channel to the irrigating fields or the canals so what is more in, what is what is interesting in this all along we saw the entrainment of air and water now we are going to see the entrainment of semi solid that is tilt so when water goes in through this the interesting part are these perforations these perforations that are seen here these perforations are for the tilt to be entrained what if the tilt is entrained this is so fertile when this goes on for the for for the irrigating uh, for irrigating the fields the water along with the stilt it is 80% of water and 20% of the stilt that goes on to irrigate the fields so this rich stilt is uh, is useful for irrigating the fields and for the growth of the crops not only that this acts as a natural destiltment of the lakes and this was developed by choras long long before even venturi was born this is the structure this was not just one or two structures it is present in almost all the lakes that are that are found in the kaveri basin that were built by choras this was uh, this was founded by the people of the chola dynasty and this was popularized 
by the great king Rajaraj of Chodan, who is also known for constructing the big temple. This was done in the even before thousand thousandth year. That is decades before Venturi was born. Are we still justified in calling that as an Venturi effect? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinodini. Unfortunately, we have not patented anything as usual. So even the turmeric has been patented by the other agencies and they say they have invented it now. So it is our fault or their fault, we cannot say, but definitely we were a big race once upon a time and I am sure we shall again achieve the same. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Now I introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Niruparaj. Uh, Dr. Niruparaj is uh, basically uh, a senior consultant there, uh, working with MIOT, and he has his areas of interest in difficult airways, head and neck surgical anesthesia and transplant anesthesia, and he is a wonderful colleague to work, and let us hear him. Niruparaj, to you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for introducing me, sir. After hearing such extensive lectures from both of us, um, I'm really mesmerized by both of your talks. I'm going to present uh, uh, on the topic of uh, monitoring related physics for anesthesiologists, which is the third topic for today. Uh, I'm Dr. Nirabraj, consultant anesthetist in Miot International. I'm going to discuss the topic in um, four different headings. Uh, physics involved in the oxygen monitoring, physics involved in the carbon dioxide monitoring, uh, physics involved in the invasive blood pressure monitoring, and uh, physics involved in the cardiac output monitoring. In general, the monitoring system is divided into four components. Uh, first will be the biological variable, sensor, integrator, and the output. All the monitoring systems are divided into these four components to make it easy to understand. Coming to the first part, that is the physics in the oxygen monitoring. Uh, we all know that the oxygen is monitored through the pulse oximeter, which was uh, introduced by the Japanese uh, bioengineers Takuyo Ayogi and Michio Kishi in the year 1974. The biological variable uh, which is involved in the monitoring of oxygen is the percentage saturation of the hemoglobin molecule, that is the SpO2. And there are two sensors, which is two LED electrodes which emits monochromatic red light at 660 nanometers and infrared light at 940 nanometers. Then comes the integrator which separates the pulsatile from the non-pulsatile component of the light. Followed by that, the integrator is connected to the output which shows the numerical uh, data of the uh, saturation followed by the plethysmograph. Thus we can see the LED light which uh, emits 660 nanometers is red. And the LED light, which emits 940 nanometer, is the infrared. These two lights flicker. And it works, the pulse oximeter works on the principle that the oxygenated hemoglobin and the deoxygenated hemoglobin have different wavelength absorption characteristics. And also, the second law is the Beer's law, third law is the Lambert's law. These three principles are employed in the oxygen uh, uh, pulse oximeter. So, as we can see, when you plot the uh, wavelength on the x-axis and the uh, absorption on the y-axis. Uh, when it comes to the red light, uh, the deoxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more of the red light. And when it comes to infrared light, the oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs infrared light at 940 nanometers. Beer's law. Beer's law states that the absorption is directly proportional to the concentration. When there is more concentration of the substance and the light is passing through it, the absorption will be more. As you can see in the Beer's law, on the left side of the figure, the concentration of the substance is less. On the right side, the concentration of the substance is more. When a light is passed from the LED diode, it is detected through the photodetector. In the photodiode, uh, actually detects a lot of light in the left side of the spectrum. Since, since the, uh, the light is uh, passing through the lesser concentration substance. On the right side, the concentration of the substance is more. So more light is getting absorbed only, and only less reaches the photodiode. Coming to the next law, that is the Lambert's law, the absorption is directly proportional to the distance traveled. When the light is traveled to longer distances, there is more of absorption naturally. This is uh, useful in detecting the pulsatile from the non-pulsatile component of the light. 
so the lambert law states uh, this so when the light is traveling through the lesser distance from the small uh, artery uh, naturally the light is absorbed less when it is going through the wider vessel the absorption is more as you can see the pulsatile waves travel for a longer distance so it is calculated as ac and non pulsatile uh, light travels for lesser distance and it is calculated as dc and depending on that the r value is calculated which is that uh, the ratio of ac 660 nanometers divided by the ac of 940 nanometers after uh, removing the dc component of the uh, 660 nanometers and 940 nanometer wavelength light the r value is plotted against the saturation of the uh, uh, oxygen when the r value is 1 the saturation is around 85% and when the r value is 0.4 which is 100% these are uh, calculated from the normal individuals and the remaining values are extrapolated in the graph uh, like what we see in the graph so coming to that the probe and the led diode uh, which detects the uh, infrared rate and red light which is uh, connected to the microprocessor which calculates the r value as you can see uh, when there is 100% saturation the ratio of absorption of uh, red light to the infrared light is different from the uh, saturation when it is 50% the ratio of absorption of red light and infrared light is uh, different coming to the next topic that is the physics in the carbon dioxide monitoring um, the carbon dioxide monitoring first was first introduced by john scott haldane in the early 20th century it was first described as the carbon dioxide analyzer coming to the components in the monitoring system uh, we have a biological variable which is the partial pressure of the uh, end tidal carbon dioxide and the sensor has side stream and the main stream and the integrator which is a computer based software which has the empiric table which converts the co2 concentration to a number and the output is a capnograph thus we can see the sensor we have a side stream and the main stream analyzer it works on the principle that molecules with two or more atoms absorb infrared light at a particular characteristic wavelength for example in the carbon dioxide we have two different atoms like carbon and oxygen it absorbs uh, the wavelength at a particular uh, wavelength and thus we can see uh, when you plot a graph stating the wavelength on the x axis and the absorption on the y axis at a wavelength of 4.26 micrometers the absorption of the carbon dioxide is maximum based on the principle uh, in accordance with the beer's law we are sending an infrared light which is passing through the uh, micrometer filter which is 4.26 micrometer after this 4.26 micrometer wavelength light is passed through the sample chamber where carbon dioxide is coming which is enclosed in a sapphire crystal so that the other lights from the external source is not getting uh, intruded in the sample chamber which is then passed through the lens and detected by the photodetector which is then extrapolated and uh, based on the software the carbon dioxide value can be optimized and the atmospheric pressure water vapor and other gases all should be negated um, uh, because there is something called collision broadening effect what is this collision broadening effect uh, the other gases which is present in the chamber like um, uh, nitrous oxide and the volatile anesthetic can interfere with the absorption of the carbon dioxide at a particular wavelength this software is device so that these things are getting negated coming to the output we have the plethysmograph which is plotted against the time and uh, in the x axis and uh, carbon dioxide value in the y axis coming to the third uh, physics involved in the monitoring system that is the physics involved in the blood pressure monitoring system the components in the monitoring system of the uh, blood pressure is also divided into four as usual the biological variable which we detect is the invasive arterial blood pressure the sensor is nothing but the diaphragm and the strain gauge which is called a transducer the integrator which uh, calibrates the static and dynamic component of the system and followed by that there is output which is a graph and the numerical value in the sensor we have the transducer which is connected to the stiff fluid fill tubing on the patient side followed by the three way tap and the flush system and the cable which is connected to the monitor followed by that there is a pressurized saline flush which is connected to the normal saline with heparin so as and when there is cardiac cycle happens the fluid moves up and down into the flexible diaphragm 
This flexible diaphragm is attached to the strain gauge on both the sides. So when the pressure is applied, the thin wire which is attached to the strain gauge which gets stretched, which increases the resistance of the strain gauge. So this is directly pro proportional to the pressure applied. More the pressure, more the resistance. From this resistance, we can calculate the pressure through the transducer. As you can see, it is integrated into the Wheatstone bridge. Uh, the strain gauge resistance is calculated as Rx. The other three resistance are calculated as R1, R2, and R3. Having known the three resistance, the resistance of the strain gauge is easily calculated using this formula. So the P, Q, R, and S are the resistors. Uh, when we don't know the value of R, that is the strain gauge resistor, the value of R can be calculated by the formula P by Q multiplied by S. Coming to the integrator, we have the static calibration. So the measured and the actual calibration of the uh, uh, invasive arterial bed pressure may be different. This software is extrapolated so that the measure and the actual calibration will not differ so much. And coming to the zeroing of the system, the level of the transducer should be kept at the level of the heart. Uh, when you increase the transducer level to more than 10 centimeter, naturally we have a blood pressure change of around seven millimeter mercury. Coming to the dynamic cal calibration, we have the resonance and damping, which Sir has discussed earlier. And the output shows the invasive arterial blood pressure tracing, which has a systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and the mean arterial pressure all can be found out. The mean arterial pressure can be calculated by the area under the curve divided by the cardiac cycle time. When we put um, uh, time on the x-axis and the blood pressure on the y-axis. Coming to the final topic, the physics in the cardiac output monitoring. Uh, as we all know, the cardiac output is heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume, which can be uh, calculated by three different uh, measurements. First is the invasive, non-invasive, and semi-invasive. Using the thermodilution method or dilution method in invasive technique and PICO, uh, which uses the fixed principle. Coming to the non-invasive part, uh, the mainly the principle involved is Doppler's effect. Coming to the fixed principle, which is uh, introduced in 1870, the organ blood flow is equal to the rate of uptake or the excretion of a substance divided by the artery minus venous concentration difference. Say, for example, the oxygen uh, uh, uptake is around 250 ml per minute. Uh, when we calculate the CA, the oxygen uh, concentration in the arterial system minus the oxygen concentration in the venous system, which is 190 minus 140, the cardiac output can be calculated as 250 divided by 50, which is equal to 5 liters per minute. The second principle which is involved in the cardiac output monitoring is the uh, apparent Doppler's effect, which is that apparent change in the frequency of the wave caused by the relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. As you see, when the stationary object is um, uh, placed and the moving object is coming closer to the stationary object, the frequency of the object is more and the wavelength will be less. When the object is moving away from the stationary observer, the wavelength will be more and the frequency of the pitch will be less. See, the Doppler's effect ultrasound is the high frequency ultrasound, where the ultrasound waves from the vibrating crystal are directed to an artery. The reflected waves by the RBCs are sensed by the other crystal. More the blood flow, more the frequency. That is, the faster the blood flow towards the probe, more the frequency. From this, we can calculate the output. The Doppler's effect can also be applied to the light as well. When the object is moving away from the source, it is called redshift. And when the object is moving towards the show, uh, towards the uh, um, source, it is called blue shift. As you can see in the electromagnetic spectrum chart, um, the visible light is placed in the center. When the when the light is going towards the low frequency side or the high wavelength side, that is called red shift. And when the light is moving towards the high frequency side or the low wavelength side, that is called blue shift. As you can see, the infrared light has a higher wavelength than low frequency, and the ultraviolet uh, or the blue spectrum light has the higher frequency and the lower wavelength. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Nelbraj, for your excellent presentation. Now I leave it to Dr. Balak. Yeah. Sir. Sorry, I can't hear you. Hello.
Hello. Hello. You... Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you uh, for this thing. I leave it to Dr. Balakrishnan, sir. For us. Uh, yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Radha, Radha, over to Radha, please. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Yes. Over to you, please. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. There may be some questions on your desk. <clears throat> One is, I think somebody was asking about robotic surgery physics. Uh, it's a, it's actually basically a complex instrument combining all the things. It has got a, you know, fiber optic system with it, camera, which gets it. It's a vision, a tactile sensation where the surgeon controls and a radiographic image all put together three dimensional. So it's a multiple complex things, which has the physical principles behind it. And actually, I have not used the robot, so I, I'm not the best person to answer it completely, but definitely, yes, physical principles are involved with it. Thank you. <clears throat> Question to Nirubraj, what is the physics behind NIBP? I, I think non-invasive blood pressure, uh, sigma manometer, uh, we, Dr. Vinodhani spoke about flow, and uh, invasive blood pressure, Dr. Nirubraj has spoken about the Wheatstone bridge and all those things, uh, non-invasive ones. Oscillatronometry and things like that. And I have spoken on damping and resonance, which relates to the invasive blood pressure. Yes, if uh, Dr. Vinodhani may like to uh, explain it further. Maybe Vinod Dr. Vinodhani may like to elaborate. Please, I, it, it, is, it is only the oscillometric, uh, oscill oscillatonometry that is. Uh, that uh, that can sense the the blood pressure actually when the systolic when the cuff is above your systolic uh, blood pressure there is no flow occurring through that part and when when it is when it is between your systolic and the diastolic that is when there is narrowing and there is varying stages of the turbulent flow happening that can be heard as a sounds and that can be measured uh, using the oscillotonometry and when the uh, when the uh, arterial wall is compression is released and when there is complete laminar flow ensuing, then that is like that point of the resumption of the laminar flow is recorded as the diastolic pressure. And the point of the cutoff of the sounds is measured by the oscillotonometry as your uh, systolic blood pressure. Correct. A pressure, pressure transduction part is involved in your, when you're doing it as a, in, via the monitor. And the auscultatory part is involved when you're using it, uh, when you're doing it manually. I think that answers the question, sir. And one more I want to add. The mean is the uh, ideal value there rather than the systolic or diastolic. That is more correlating with the whole thing. Any further questions from anybody? No, sir. I'm not seeing anything. Sir, I can see, sir, these are the only questions by delegates. There is no more questions. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Prana. Thank you. Yeah, the session can was I... excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just make a comment, Dr. Radha Please, Krishna? please. As um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shankar, Krishna Shankar was saying about the robo is a very uh, advanced technology. I just wanted to add, like in this robo, uh, for, of course, the students have to read a lot about it and understand. But basically, one of the advantages, one of the additions that they have done in this physics is when we talk about degrees of freedom of the hand. So when we are operating either in the proscopy or open, you have only three degrees of movement of the wrist. Whereas for the robo, you have seven degrees of freedom. So that is that means your robo, uh, uh, the this thing, it can move seven times. So your wrist can actually have seven movements. So that actually aids in the dissection and how you can actually go behind, behind some organ like the gallbladder, which you cannot do in laparoscopy where you hardly have two or three degrees of freedom. So that is what is one of the terminologies that is used in robo. Thank Just you, wanted Arun. to add that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. 
good <laughs> very good yeah. yes dr radha krishnan please continue hi it's okay now i was wondering whether anybody has any questions to be clear i presume all are satisfied very well with the results thank you sir yeah yeah correct and uh, i really thank you for an excellent session thank you sir it's all done by you okay all thank you to you <laughs> thank you for one of the very best areas which you are able to ponder and you adequate explanation on everything about it um it's still a lot sir we could only choose some of the topics here because of time yeah we didn't talk much on this cylinders any cylinders of not that much i thought it was covered in yeah. the machine somebody had covered it before so i just can not repeat most of the things yeah dr radha krishnan can i make a comment please please uh when uh, dr krishnan uh, initiated his uh, lecture and he said a uh, very very wi- very wisely very well presented uh, a, a dictum or rather saying that oh really uh, i was not good in physics and and that's how i went into medicine uh, if yeah. i was but i would have gone elsewhere then why yeah. else why again i should go you know uh, and read uh, physics that was uh, the usual concept that we feel about but i tell you one story when we were doing our 12th biology uh the, the physics teacher uh, who who used to talk to this biology section uh, physics to this biology section uh, was different than the one who used to teach a uh, uh, math section by uh, physics to math section he was more learned supposed to be very very uh, dedicated physicist and this gentleman had done msc physics has not done phd he was just an average person and he was teaching very well and one day he asked he asked a question which uh, some of us only answered then what he said you know he said i know you are doing biology most of you want to do to medical colleges but only those who are good in physics will ultimately land up into the medical college because everyone studies botany zoology chemistry fairly well and physics is the one which very often you ignore and that's what is the difference that it makes when you uh, in your uh, merit so read physics well if you want to go to medical college that's what the that was the <laughs> teacher that he told us you know i i remember i i always remember and especially when i entered uh, anesthesiology i realized i have come to the right branch because i remember the saying of that teacher the rather teaching of that, our good teacher that yes anesthesiology has lot of physics really it has lot everything we do is physics for that matter thank you so much thank you sir Wonderful, wonderful. There are some uh, two questions I see in the chat box. Uh, you may go ahead, Krishna. Yeah. Artificial intelligence and its applications. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is really coming in, and maybe that will be the future of anesthesia. Also, people will be seeing everything and commenting from the home itself and controlling the whole thing like the surgeon who is controlling the robo now we will be controlling it from our home this is going to come perhaps i don't know whether we will be seeing it or not maybe the next generation will see definitely because it's really coming in a big way the data analysis and everything and plugging everything so they will definitely get it to that level soon uh can i add on this up is yes sir yeah uh at at the institute of uh, anesthesiology in gangaram hospital we are seeing the glimpses of this ai technology where uh, we have collaborated madam sood has collaborated with pgi chandigarh and we have a closed loop anesthesia delivery system and we are doing studies on it and okay. the results have been very encouraging we hope to see very good models in the future for these things and very even the role of ultrasound has come in a long way into the ot so i really hope we have a bright future ahead on these things Thank you. Thank you. Very true, Sumit. And there's one more question. Something about the temperature monitor, Dr. Krishna. Uh, we uh, temperature is entirely a big topic on itself, so I have not taken it. Maybe the next time, temperature, heat exchange, and all those should come together. And lights, light is one thing, and sound, all things, I uh, couldn't be 
uh, com uh, completed in it. Definitely temperature, heat, it's a big favorite question for many persons. And, uh, you know, we can have it as a next talk. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll reserve that for you. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, the Dr. Deshi, will you yes, wind up the session? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so as Dr. Radhakrishnan said, thank you very much. It was an excellent webinar, Dr. Krishna Shankar. I can't, uh, I have no words to praise all the speakers, all from your hospital. I mean, it was excellent. And as Dr. Radhakrishnan said in the beginning, physics in UK, if you do not pass the first FRCA part one in physics, you had it. So you don't get through. So I remember when we went abroad, like physics, of course, we had learned in PGI, but the amount we had to learn to pass the FRCS exam was a tremendous. FFA, too, it was called FFARCS that time. Yeah. So, and then as he said, in other Europe and America, it's still there, but in India, somehow it's less, but still a question that definitely comes. And I think we as teachers, must make it a point that the students know their machines in and out as well as the others. And we do have good teachers in our departments and like you all have given such good lectures, I'm sure your students have benefit a lot and <laughs> listening to the webinars tomorrow, the ones who have not heard today, I'm sure it will go a long way. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Vinodhini and Dr. Natesh, each and every topic of yours was so well covered and so clear and so interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, we shall be meeting you all. Uh, the webinar will be next week when we'll be seeing all of you again. Thank you very much and good night. Thank, thank you, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you, Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Good night, Thank you, ma'am. Good night, ma'am. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Very well. Done. See you. Thank you, Dr. Good you, Mishra. And good thank good you, good good uh, Thank you for us. Good night. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Uh, with night. all your permission. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you all, sir. Yeah.